I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome back to True Crime Loser. I hope you're doing well. So today we're going to go over the infamous San Francisco cancer doctor that went down in absolute NBC to catch a predator flames, Dr. Maurice Wolin. I didn't do anything. And whenever I think of the classic to catch a predator footage of Dr. Maurice Wolin, I can't help but think of his wife on a beautiful afternoon in 2006 in San Francisco, California. The flowers are blooming. The grass is green. She has two daughters to worry about. And all of a sudden, early afternoon, she gets a phone call. And I would guess that she thought, huh, that must, maybe that's, that's Maurice, her husband. Hadn't heard from him for a few hours. And she picks up the phone on a beautiful San Francisco day, not knowing that it's a life-changing call. And it's her husband. And the first thing that he says is, honey, I'm in big trouble. Whenever you hear, whenever a family member calls and says that, your mind instantly starts racing. Is this a health thing? Did he? Is this a career thing? Did he get in trouble? You know what is going on? Your, your mind and your body starts reacting to those words. Honey, I'm in big trouble. And her husband, no matter what she could speculate in her head, what? Why? What? what trouble? What do you mean? I doubt that she would guess that her husband, the cancer doctor is standing in a trailer, handcuffed pathetically, where his wrists are attached to his belt, and he's holding the phone like this and going, Honey, I'm in big trouble. And then he goes, I'll explain. You got to bail me out of jail. And he goes, It was a sting. I love the tone that he says that in. It was a sting. Like, it just happens all the time. Yeah, sorry, babe. Another sting. Yeah, I'll explain. Another sting. Use the sting fund. I love you. Got to bail me out. $30,000 check. It was a sting. And then he goes, don't bring the girls. And then the classic line, I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. That's as the footage fades away. What if he used that logic in his cancer fighting career? He walks into a patient and goes, you you don't have cancer, but you have cancer. We're not going to do any treatment, but we are going to do the full treatment. And so I guess we'll start at the very beginning with old Dr. Maurice Wolin. Like I said, a beautiful afternoon in 2006. Dr. Maurice Wolin got into his car and got onto the highway and drove away from San Francisco with his life, his career, and pretty much everything he ever worked for in the rearview mirror heading to what he thought was a 13-year-old girl's house. And I'm sure as he was driving down that color or the California highway, his heart rate was jacked. I'm, I'm sure he was smiling and the windows were down and I wonder what he was listening to, probably singing at the top of his lungs. I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid just jacked, not knowing that he's pretty much driving to his execution, the end of life as he knows it. And I can't imagine the years since then how many times he's thought to himself, man, I really wish I wouldn't have gone that day. Yeah. And so he's driving 40 minutes to the house that he thinks there's a 13-year-old girl. Instead, it's chucked Filled with cops and TV crew and cameras and pretty much the exact opposite that he's hoping for. And so he gets there. And I was thinking, these day and age, a subdivision like that has so many doorbell cams that I don't even know if something like this would work. But he gets there, parks his car, just like they all do, and does this real sly kind of look around. He's walking in. The flowers are blooming. The grass is green. He gets to the open garage. He does one more of these. All right, I think I'm good. As long as I can just get back into this house without being seen, I'm good. One more look. 
and then he enters into the garage and then they always hire that like some little cute actress with a sweet voice like hey there you are come on back i'm about ready to put my swimsuit on and you could tell he's like oh good yeah perfect and he's in the garage and it's it's notable to think about how much so he's in the garage right there he's confident he's looking around he's thinking this is it i all of the fantasizing about this is over it's time to do something and less than like a minute or two later he's back into the garage and it's wild to think how much in this guy's life has changed in that one minute and so he follows the sweet voice of the young actress around through the side of the house and they go in the backyard i guess this is to catch a predator pool edition or whatever but this one they did out in the backyard so they go around and she they always do the little cute actress always has to do something to get away from they don't want to be close to these guys in case they go in for a hug or something or worse and so she goes okay i'm gonna put on my swimsuit pour yourself a drink and i'll be right back and she goes around off camera behind like a room partition and uh and he sits at the bar oh yeah and i wanted to note as he's walking through the garage and then they go to the side of the house to the backyard he, any time I start feeling sorry for these guys, you just got to listen to what they say in the chat and look at them before they got caught because as he's following her back, he is vibrating with excitement. He he has these eyes of just, you know, it's predator. Literally, he looks like a predator following her, just like, he gets to the backyard. She's like, I'm going to change into my little swimsuit. I'll be right back. She disappears. He's sitting there at the bar. There's a big blender full of frogs and margarita. He's feeling all cool. Yeah. Where, she's like, where'd you come from? He's San Francisco. And he starts to pour the margarita. And this is where it all goes wrong for him. This is a metaphor for how the whole rest of his life is going to go. Because instead of a nice little normal amount of margarita, the whole blender slides clumped out into the cup, all over the table, all over his hands. So already, you know, you're trying to, he's trying to be smooth. He's there trying to court a child and he dumps the margarita everywhere and he goes, he's, oh, Jesus. And he looks up to see if she saw. He's, oh. You could tell he's doing one of those, like, when you screw up on a date or something, just like, oh, man. One time I did the, like on a first day, I spilled a gigantic ice water. It was one of those restaurants that gives you just a enormous ice water so they don't have to fill it up. And I dumped, pushed the entire thing onto the date's lap. And then was just like, yeah, sorry. But I don't know, it didn't really affect anything. But anyway, so he's has that like, oh man, I just, and then he gets up and here, I'm pretty sure if you watch it, there's a towel right in front of him on the chair. But he goes, you know, he's sitting there with sticky margarita hands. It's all over the table. He probably doesn't want her to see his stupid mistakes. So he stands up and he goes, ah, oh, do you have a towel? And he walks to where she's changing. I'm pretty sure there's a towel right there. You probably could have figured it out without going and seeing the 13-year-old or the, I guess, yeah, the actress pretending to be the 13-year-old changing and so you know it's no coincidence that he walks right over to where she was changing and one of the funniest parts to me about the whole thing is he thinks when he turns that corner he's going to see the cute actress with the nice little voice that had walked around and it's almost a magic trick because when he turns that corner with his creepy predator i didn't do anything eyes thinking he's gonna see what he thinks in his mind he's gonna see there and all of a sudden she's not there and it's just a bunch of sweaty dudes with tech camera gear and i'm sure it i can't imagine what he and all of a sudden he just pops right out of it and the first thing he does is he looks off he he looks off in the distance the same way a hero in a Western movie would look out at the sunset out before a big quest or something. So it's hilarious. He looks off at the distance, puts his sunglasses on, and he goes, I got to take off. <laughs> 
I love that line. I got to take off. Yeah, buddy. It's time to go. And so he's doing the, yep, I'm just walking as if not, I'm not in the backyard of a 13-year-old. Has to be a drag, too. You think you're going, think he thought he was alone in the house, and instead there's just many, many dudes with tech gear. And so now he's walking the same route that he came in instead of being like, eh, he's going through and he, through the side of the house and he comes out through the garage and much to his may. Oh yeah, also too, as he's walking out, Chris Hansen's behind him going, sir, sir, and Maurice Wolin's getting on his horse and he's going and he's turning the corner and five sheriffs with their guns out going, get on the ground, get on the ground. And the first thing he does is he takes his sunglasses off and he spikes them on the ground like a like a spoiled child. And it's like, yeah, dude, I know you're probably going down for attempted child molestation, but you didn't have to break your glasses, okay? Unnecessary. So first thing he does is he just out of pure anger at seeing the mess that he's in and the staring down the barrel of five guns he shatters his glasses on the garage door floor and they come you know get on the ground get on the ground and he's just going he just starts going i didn't do anything i did i wasn't doing anything i wasn't and they take his head and remember he walked confidently through the garage a minute before going <sighs> and now the same floor of the garage that he strutted through after the child they mush his face into the concrete and then they zip tie his arms they pull him back up and they're roughly going through his pockets and he's just going i didn't i wasn't doing anything i wasn't doing anything and i guess that's that's the only thing you can say at that point and then they bring him to a trailer for booking which makes it worse. It's like, can I at least get booked for child molestation in a building? Do we have to do this in a trailer? For God's sakes. And then the cops, so he's sitting there before the interrogation. He's sitting there handcuffed. And we don't get to see the, the footage just straight through. It's all chopped up with Chris Hansen uh, commentating. But So Chris Hansen's going, and he there tried the... The cops tried to talk to him, but nothing was sinking in, and he's all just dazed out. Going, I didn't do anything, but I did something stupid. And one of the cops goes, all right, you're going to talk to a detective. And then the other cop standing right there has a clipboard, I think trying to make everything he's doing look more professional or just, you know. And so he's going, the other one was like, you're going to talk to a detective. And the other guy goes, I already told him that, but he's he's not responding. He's failing to and he kind of he goes he's failing and he kind of trails off because he can't finish that sentence you're allowed to remain silent but a little trick dirty little trick that the cops play is while you're, you're sitting there scared you know maurice is terrified obviously while you're sitting there scared you don't want to get in any more trouble than you think you are they do stuff to get you to talk by being like yeah i don't know talking to his buddy i don't know he's failing to you know he can just kind of trail off and Maurice takes the bait. He doesn't wait for, what am I failing to do? He just goes, I'm not failing to do anything. I'm just really scared. I haven't done anything in my whole life. And, I'm, and he starts talking. They, it works. They get him to talk. But if you're sitting there and a cop tries to pull that on you, like, yeah, he's, he's failing to just go failing to what? Fin yeah, go ahead and finish that sentence. I was under the impression I could remain silent. So what am I failing to do, Mr. Officer? But it works, and then so he goes into the interrogation trailer. He's moved from the booking trailer into the interrogation trailer. And what I found out in the, uh, the last couple days doing a deep dive into this guy is a judge actually deemed this interrogation unconstitutional. And so I really wish we had the whole footage because I can't think of another example of that where... Um, it gets to trial and the judge essentially throws out the whole thing. And what they said was, and NBC clips it all up with the commentary of Chris Hansen. And Chris Hansen is saying, you know, even though he asked for a lawyer, the 
The detective asked four times, are you sure you would like to keep talking? And Dr. Maurice Wolin agreed. And it's so it's just like, well, that's just your apparently that's just your opinion, Chris Hansen, because it got to a trial and a judge didn't think that. So it's pretty interesting with that one. But anyway, so they sit down for the what was later deemed the unconstitutional interrogation and it takes him a while to waive his rights, like I said. And then they just ask him, why did you come here today? And his only answer is, um, I was curious. I was curious. That's it. I wasn't going to do anything. I wasn't going to do anything. That's the truth. And as we've talked about a lot, as you, you never do the interrogation, just say lawyer. But these are even worse than all the other interrogation possibilities because of the chat logs. They all have 47 pages of these insane graphic chats that you can't argue away. The, all of the, the To Catch a Predator's uh, interrogations kind of go the same. They go, I wasn't going to do anything. And then the detective just picks up the chat and goes, oh, right here on page 43, it says that you were definitely going to do something. And then it goes, well, I... I thought she was over 18. And it says, well, on page 32, it says, I love that you're only 13. You know, it's just like, there's no... And in all of them, the more that the detective goes, references the chat, they keep going back to the chat, they all just get this face of like, oh, God. The more it's read, you know, it's like, oh, God, don't read the chat. Anything but the chat. And so they get done with the extremely chopped up and edited in interrogation i'd love to see the whole thing and then it ends with him bringing them bringing him to the trailer making that call where he says honey i'm in big trouble i didn't do anything but i did something stupid and um he maurice having a lot more money than most of the to catch a predator dudes fought the case for a good part of three years and after the three years, you can imagine his name and reputation in town were pretty much over after all of the news stories being like, he tried to sleep with a kid. Here's his picture. It's hard to come back after that. And um, eventually, after, like I said, two plus years, he pleaded no contest and got just two months in jail, which I think is way less than most of the other To Catch a Predator dudes. And three years probation and a lifetime of registering as a sex offender. And that is the story of Dr. Maurice Wolin, the man that didn't do anything but did something stupid. I'm going to cut it off there. I hope you're having a good day. I'll see you next time. Why? Stavin' why? Shamir.